For years, I've been known as a person that invests in people and small businesses. I do it on television with The Profit, and now I'm doing it right here on this podcast. I'm Marcus Slimonis, and every week I'll introduce you to innovative businesses that are looking to expand and improve. We'll find out about their biggest struggles and what's holding them back. I'll provide some feedback, some real-world coaching, and then create a blueprint for their future. Look, sometimes deals are going to happen, and sometimes they're not. You never know who's going to show up or what you're going to hear. This is 100%. I've always had this love-hate relationship with food. I think it's more love than it is hate. I love the fact that there's always a story behind every single thing you meet. Something that somebody's grandmother made as a recipe or some idea that they came up with while they were traveling abroad. Or in some cases, it's an innovative chef who just has amazing ideas. The entrepreneurs you're about to meet love good quality food, just like I do. Suzanne and Bettina own a taco restaurant in Washington, D.C. Not any taco restaurant. It's one that people can't get enough of. But it has an unusual twist. There are only six tacos on the menu, and they're 100% meatless. It's called Chaya Tacos. They came up with the idea for their company. Their mission was a simple one. We want people to eat more vegetables. And almost a decade later, that mission statement hasn't changed. How are you, ladies? We're good. So tell me a little bit about how you guys came up with this idea. I'm fascinated by it, and I feel like this could be a really cool concept. I know I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, and the time was right. We each had three children. They were growing. We were anxious. We were eager. We love cooking. We love hospitality. We wanted to bring something exciting to D.C. But vegetable tacos. We're having fun. Like, they're tacos. It's like maybe a vegetable you've never even tried before, and you're having it in a new way. How fun is that? Suzanne, what did you do before this? I have a science background, and then I moved to D.C. to be an environmental consultant. Oh, wow. Bettina, you were an editor of a magazine. What kind of magazine was it? I helped start Condé Nast Traveler. So for me, there's a publishing and design background. Okay, so one of you is more right-brained and one of you is more left-brained, and you've bonded over food? Yes. We were in a cookbook club together for years, so we started cooking together. It was a time when farmer's markets were booming. People were trying to figure out how to shop the markets and what to cook. And, you know, it dawned on us one day. We were searching for food. We wanted it to be fast. We wanted it to be casual. It was like, why are people using more food from the farmer's markets and letting it drive their menus? Why are people using more vegetables? Why can't something like squash or collards or something like that be part of a menu? So we came up with this kind of the farm meets street style. Then we started in a farm stand. We found ourselves a kitchen space. It was just Bettina and I, the two of us, okay? <laughs> we're gonna make these three tacos and we're gonna roll them out to market and see if anyone buys them. And I remember I was walking out that morning. My daughter, who was probably in eighth grade at the time, looked at me and she said, Mom, I just feel like this is gonna be really embarrassing for you. Wow. And I said, why? And she said, well, who wants a squash taco? And I said, well, I don't know. We're going to find out. That very first day, we sold 50 trios in an hour and a half. So we came back with enough food the next week to feed 100 people three tacos. We sold out in an hour and a half. And so we hired a few people and we eventually got to a place where we had eight people in our little 10 by 10 foot tent and we just cranked. We didn't stop. I love the fact that you guys are pioneers in the space. What makes the place different? When we opened up this store in Georgetown five years ago, we hit it out of the park. There was something about this location where it shouldn't have worked. We're on a one-way street going the wrong way. Yep. We're sort of hidden from the rest of the neighborhood. But what we actually did was create a micro-neighborhood where all these little independent local businesses have now opened up here. Wow. But I think where we differentiated ourselves at the beginning, first of all, we don't try to ever shame anybody for doing anything. So we are not fully vegan. 
we know that dairy and cheese and saltiness and all that flavor adds to the food that we're making, but we're almost 97% vegan friendly. And within six months of us showing up at that farmer's market, we had literally been named one of the top nine tastemakers in DC. I do feel that Suzanne and I have really been part of what has made DC a much more interesting and vibrant city. And we were part of that trend early on. It's become a real huge foodie town. It really has. So that was huge accomplishment that we had this plant powered idea. And what we were creating was this really delicious, super craveable food that they actually came back and wanted every single week. Suzanne, was there ever an I told you so moment to your daughter? We talked about making t-shirts that said, no one wants a squash taco and wearing them. Oh, that's actually pretty clever. I love that. Yeah, no, she's a Chaya fan as well as, you know, she's in that 20 year old age group. And so her friends love it as well as she loves it. So one location today, right? We have two. So I have a very popular senator friend and I texted him and asked him if he knew about this. And he said, yeah, everybody in DC knows about this. And he said, the one thing about it is that it's super healthy, but you don't feel like you're eating plants. It has a lot of flavor and you're not missing out on the fact that there's not meat. Is that what you hear from a lot of people? Yeah, and that was always the desire that anything we put out there, you wanted to want it again. You want to desire it the next day. Do you guys own an air fryer? No. Okay, so I recently decided about nine months ago to cut meat and dairy totally out of my diet. I couldn't give up fish. And I'm obsessed with vegetables, which is why I was excited to talk to you guys. But I've now bought this air fryer, which essentially just turns vegetables into crispy little snacks. I'm gonna send you both one. That sounds awesome. It's a game changer. And I told everybody here that I wanted to open up a restaurant just with air fryers. And my teammate said, is that gonna be like the melting pot? I was like, ick and no. We're not gonna dip anything. We're just gonna make it in an air fryer. Well, if we steal your idea and incorporate it in any way into our menu, we will definitely give you credit. I just wanna be Marcus fried in. <laughs> All right, how many different tacos on the menu? Six. Okay, so it's a nice, simple menu. It's a nice, simple menu. We have six sides. Five of those are all vegetable based. Can you describe a couple of your tacos? Well, that roasted butternut squash taco is absolutely delicious. We roast that butternut squash oh. and it's got some spice on it. It has red chili peppers, but then we toss it with caramelized onion. So this sweetness has a hint of maple syrup in it and the bright freshness of the herbs that we pair with it. The combination is hot and sweet, but sweet in just the right way. Who came up with these recipes? The two of us. Did you have formal training or are you just two ladies that know what you want? We had the cookbook club. <laughs> wow. Do you do a lot of revenue? Yes, we do. Sales are, you know, we're very proud of them. <laughs> awesome. How many tacos will Georgetown sell a year? I know that last year before COVID, we had sold over three and a half million tacos. Are you, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me. Three and a half million tacos? <laughs> it was a lot of tacos. Wow. All right, I have two business questions and then I'm gonna put you guys to the challenge. And the challenge is gonna be super stressful. You're gonna probably sweat. You're gonna need water, but it's gonna be fun. Uh oh. So two questions before we have our challenge. Number one, what's the average order per customer? It's almost $20. Okay, and what are your food costs? Oh, they're 26%. Okay, so two numbers that you just gave me, the reason I asked them is those are magic numbers in the world of franchising. Rent obviously is a factor and labor is a factor. We'll get to that. But when you can have a great average ticket and you can have really low food costs, that is the recipe for magic. Now, the hard part about a franchise is that foodie concepts work on the edges of America. They work in LA and San Francisco and Washington and New York and Miami. You can come up with any concept because they're international. The key to a franchise concept is being able to sell one and convince somebody in the middle of America. And so the challenge that I have for you, and I promise you it's gonna be fun, is I'm going to bring on a friend of mine. And this friend is a 13 time country music award nominee, a three time Grammy nominee, He's got his own show, he's got his own clothing line, and he is a true cowboy. Come on. 
I'm just a country boy, and yes, I do enjoy showing them city folk my hell raising If you can sell a cowboy on eating vegetable tacos in Nashville, Tennessee, then you've hit all these different marks. Profitability, average ticket size, food cost, the passion that you two have, the knowledge of your menu. Are you guys up for the challenge? Sure. Well, hello, John Rich. Hey, guys. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Okay, so my friends Bettina and Suzanne are here with the biggest challenge of today. They have an amazing idea. They run an unbelievable business in Washington, D.C. I think it's a franchisable concept, but I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to that stuff. And I said to them, if you can convince a cowboy and one of the best business people that I know in America to eat the kind of food you have, then there's something here. Okay. Are you guys ready? I'm nervous. <laughs> Can I ask one question before you pitch it? No matter what it is, am I allowed to put barbecue sauce on it before I eat it? You won't need to. Well, there's a reason he asked that because where's the Redneck Riviera barbecue sauce? Oh yeah, I've got it. I've got it all sitting right behind me, man. Oh, wait, hold on. Do you know why you won't need to? Because we actually make an incredible hot sauce that people literally lick the inside of the <laughs> container. So I think you're gonna find it equally delicious. All right. Let's go, Bettina, you're up. All right, so John, nice to meet you. So Chaya, we're here in Washington, D.C. We have two shops founded by Suzanne and myself, and we are unconventional. We hand griddle corn tortillas and we fill them with the most deliciously roasted, braised, sauteed, every which way vegetables. We hand make all of our sauces. We pair them with delicious tangy cheeses. Our tacos are absolutely delicious and super craveable. And you don't miss the meat. How many of you sold? Tell them, tell them how many you've sold. Over 3 million tacos. Whoa. I know, right? 3 million tacos? Yep. So I don't know if you know this, but I'm a Texan. I was raised in Amarillo, Texas. So I think the first girl I ever kissed, my tongue burnt for two days. Everything she ate was so hot. <laughs> was it she hot or was everything she ate hot? Yeah, she was hot and everything she ate was hot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Bettina, can I join the pitch team for 30 seconds? Because I want to add a few things. Sure. The one thing that I know about John, and we've been friends for, gosh, almost like 15 years now, is that American made, I don't know if you can see on the screen, there's American flags on his shirt, on his everywhere, that, that one of the things, John, that's important to the two of them is that the vegetables are all locally sourced or American sourced, is that right? Seasonal and local is best practice, yes. Organic as often as possible. Listen, I eat vegetables all the time. I mean, I grew up in Texas. I'm a high school graduate. My dad's a non-denominational preacher who preached in prisons and places like that. We never had extra money, so we had big gardens. So we had like a one acre garden. I hoed more weeds than I can possibly tell you. And, you know, we grew our okra, jalapenos, habaneros, squash, zucchini, black eyed peas, on and on and on. I grew up eating all that stuff. And, you know, if it's vegetables wrapped in a handmade corn tortilla that'll light my tongue on fire, I'm probably a customer. Well, it is that. Can you fry the okra and put it in a taco? That'd be pretty good. Air fried. It's delicious, yes. So John, the reason that I wanted to connect you guys is because they're at the point where they have to start making decisions about growth. Do we grow ourselves? Do we franchise the concept? And I walk them through the benefits of really franchising because you don't have to manage the labor. You're giving another individual a chance to be an entrepreneur. You get an owner operator running the shop as opposed to a manager in another town. And you're able to get mailbox money and that's a big deal. And so, what I said to them is, if you can convince the middle of America, not Washington, New York, LA, Miami, but the middle of America to adopt a concept, which is why Bowling Green, Kentucky, is one of the hotbeds for concept tests. Oddly enough, Bowling Green, Kentucky, they make Coravettes and they launch franchises. I don't know if people knew that. If you can get that group of the country to buy off on a concept, then it pretty much translates everywhere. So Nashville is a pretty cosmopolitan town. Where would this concept work in Nashville and would it work? Well, yeah, Nashville, I think we're in like the top three or four cities in America that people are moving to. I mean, I see more out-of-state tags. I see more California tags, New York tags, Illinois tags every day coming into Nashville. So you've got that crowd and then you've got your base crowd you know, which is the Southern crowd here. But Nashville is a great town for something like this because 
man, people love to eat, they love to drink, and they love to go have fun. The good thing about a taco is you can grab it on the way and eat it as you're heading down to my bar downtown, you know? It's an easy transition. Well, nothing would make my husband happier than to open something in Nashville because he actually went to Vanderbilt and lived there for a while. So we are a house filled with country music bands. So <laughs> they would all be about that. Right on. <laughs>
It may be 16 or 15. Your average food cost may not be 27 because you could be somewhere where the cost of getting the vegetables to the market would make it 30% or 28 or 29%. And you want to play with that whole model. But the fact that John was even open to the idea, I thought, okay, who's the most meat-eating, Texas hat-wearing, whiskey-drinking, music-playing guy I know? If he's open to the idea, it's a good litmus test. John's tough. The thing that people don't know about John is he's a serious business person. He's kind of a ball breaker. John, how many days a week do people bring you deals to invest in? A lot. Anything from music, and then it's scoped way outside of that in the past seven or eight years. But, you know, one thing I would tell the ladies is I'm a real-time example of somebody that owns an establishment that I have not franchised yet. I own a bar in downtown Nashville right on Broadway. It's probably the highest traffic street in America called Redneck Riviera. As soon as I opened it, I had people calling me from other states, other towns, wanting to have a Redneck Riviera in their town. And it's a lot of bait on the hook that you want to bite because it's exciting to think about having your establishment in all these other towns. But to Marcus's point, until you've shot your own thing full of holes over and over and over and over and figured out what works about it, what doesn't work about it, and all the different metrics that go into play, how you market it, who you're marketing to, who you want to get in, how do you get them to come back, until you troubleshoot all that stuff, you don't need to open more stores. It sounds like you've gone down that road, but for me and my bar, we're going to consider in 2021 maybe doing two and start there because you want to grow something that's got a foundation underneath it. Because it's a big investment for somebody to take on. And also what you don't want is to open up new stores and they don't work because things you never thought of or didn't give it enough time to play out and you moved a little too soon. So it's exciting, but you got to be careful how you go about it. Do you serve food at your bar? Yeah, we have food. So it's a bar and barbecue. Well, maybe we need to come and be guest chefs at some point and do that fried okra taco. Hey, you're welcome to come test it in my bar anytime you want. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Hey, John, I'm going to put you on the spot. And I know you're going to get mad at me. And I know you're going to text me after. When you and I met the first time on Celebrity Apprentice, there's a guitar behind you. Yeah. I'd like you to grab it. And I just need a little taco, vegetable taco jingle. Something, something, Chaya Tacos. Oh, God, this is very on the spot. I mean, Chaya Tacos. If you want to know what a taco can be, Chaya Tacos for you and me. If you want to know what all a taco should be, try Chaya Taco for you and me. Need a Chaya Taco, yeah. <laughs> Save a horse, eat a taco. Whoa! That was amazing. <laughs> Save a horse, eat a taco. That's our new slogan. <laughs> John's a businessman. You can license anything from him. He's a great business person. There you go. Have at it. Bettina and Suzanne, any questions for me or John before you go? No, I mean, thank you so much. This was great. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much and take care. And we'll be in touch, okay? Air fryers are coming. The air fryers <laughs> are coming. Thank you. Okay, guys. Be good. Bye-bye. I love putting you on the spot. Okay. Do you remember the Camping World song you made for me? Welcome to Camping World. Welcome to Camping World. We've got all the camping things for you boys and girls. That's it. Welcome to Camping World. Welcome to Camping World. We've got everything you'll ever need at Camping World. Just so everybody knows, John made that jingle on The Celebrity Apprentice. And John and I have been friends ever since. John, I want to get an update on the explosive brand, Redneck Riviera. Can you give us a quick summary on how it's doing? Yeah. So Redneck Riviera, you know, it's a phrase that's been around since the early 60s. It's a lifestyle. It's a way you go about your life. It's work hard, play hard. And I was able to get that trademark. Redneck Riviera Whiskey is now in 11,000 stores in 49 states. And I give 10% back on every bottle that we sell to the Folds of Honor. They put kids through college who lost a parent in combat. And to date, Redneck Riviera Whiskey has now funded over 100 college grants in the past 18 months. We've got a bar downtown called Redneck Riviera. 
I've got a barbecue sauce coming out with Red Gold, which is an American owned, American grown company. And we're having a blast, man. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Awesome. So I have my fast five questions. You ready? Yep. What song is on repeat on your phone right now? What do you love to listen to? Right now, I've got Frank Sinatra. I've got the world on a string. Sitting on a rainbow. Nobody thought that was coming. What was your first car? I've still got it. 1971 Dodge Dart Swinger, baby blue with a white top. Who bought it for you? I bought it myself, 600 bucks. I earned it from mowing yards. If you can record a song with any artist, who would it be? Wow. Sting. Really? Why? Sting's a bad man. He's a bad man, and nobody knows how to get a hold of Sting. So if I could do it, I would probably get with Sting. We know where he lives. You know where he lives? Yeah, he lives right here on Central Park West. Okay. So my producer, James, thinks he knows where he lives. Okay, James, why don't we go to his house, knock on the door, and see if he answers? Let's see how that works out. <laughs> on your single, The Good Lord and the Man. Well, he was one of the millions who signed up to defend us. Who is the man you're referring to? The man I'm referring to in that song is my grandfather, World War II vet, Six Purple Hearts, hooked on morphine for two years when he got back home. And I wrote that song about the really the historical journey that he took at the age of 17, lied about his age so he could join the war effort early and uh, served his country valiantly. And if it wasn't for the good Lord and the man, and he represents, of course, all our vets, we wouldn't have a free country today. Thank you for his service. Thank you to all the men and women who are active or retired or who have passed away, who have protected us and given us our freedom. So thank you. Every guitar player names their guitar. What's your guitar's name? I don't think I've named my guitar, Marcus. I have a lot of guitars. I don't really name them. I've named some of my cars, but I haven't named any of my guitars. Maybe I'll name it Marcus. No, 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 because then you'll be playing me like a fiddle all day long. I'm tickling your strings, Marcus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> John, I want to thank you. You know, all kidding aside, we've known each other for 12 years now, and you have been a consistent friend to me through thick or thin, even when you didn't always agree with me. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for your sincerity and your honesty and your transparency. And for those of you that love whiskey, please, please buy a bottle. Because what he's doing with the Redneck Riviera brand and how he's giving back to people is more important to me than anything else. In fact, John and I are getting ready to do a plating change program with a, a local restaurant and taking care of the food insecure. Biggest heart and the biggest hat. And I'm grateful for our friendship, buddy. So thank you for coming on. Hey, I'd like to highlight something you just said that is so important for Americans. This country is not going to get any easier over the coming months or possibly even years. And you're going to disagree with other people and sometimes very strongly disagree with them. But you have got to remember that we're still Americans and we should still have each other's back at the end of the day. And you're right, Marcus, you and I don't agree on everything. That doesn't change the fact that we respect each other. We help each other when one of us calls and we're here to help others outside of ourselves. And I think Americans need to remember that as we head into these next few months. What's funny about it is that you and I are pretty different. And if we were walking down the street, people would be like, those guys are friends. <laughs> and I love the fact that I can call you one and I appreciate you. Anytime. We'll see you soon, brother. All right, brother, thanks. You know, the one thing that I wanna leave with is that everybody's different. We come from different places and we live different lives and we have different points of view on things. And when we disagree with each other, we tell each other respectfully. This country is the best country in the world because it allows you the opportunity to have an opinion. The most important thing is that we respect those opinions. John Rich and I couldn't be more different, but at the end of the day, we're pretty much the same. We both love our country and we love each other and we love the idea of making the American dream. And that's why we're here. Thanks for joining me today on a hundred percent. This podcast is hosted and executive produced by me, Marcus Limonis. It's executive produced by Nancy Glass and James Balash. Produced by Joanne Cosro and Andrea D'Ambrosio. Other members of the production team include Andrea Gunning, Ben Fetterman, Lindsay Livingston, Carrie Hartman, Elena Carmazan, Thomas McClellan, Madeline Cole, Samantha Jacobson, and Brittany Vuzo. Edited by Matt Del Vecchio and Blake Maples. And the sound mixing is done by Dave Saya. A special shout out to Gotham Studios in New York City, Elliot Lanham at Hidden City Studios, BAM Studios in Chicago, and MIBE Music. 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 Music.